<laughs> welcome, boys and girls. All right. And welcome again to another episode of Prevail's Compliance Corner. Uh, I am Orly, the Director of Marketing here at Prevail, and I am joined once again by my colleague, Noelle. Noelle, Hi. it has been too Yay. long. I yes. know it's been too long. I'm so glad to be back. Yay. Ooh. We have applause yeah. from the audience. Applause. to use that. I know you're waiting. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, Noelle has been out uh, working on some important compliance stuff for a little bit, but she's come back and I promised I, I wouldn't make this session too hard for her, right? We're going to just talk about the simple stuff. We're not going to work her too hard. Um, we're going to just do kind of um, a little bit of a delayed or uh, recap of our webinar from a couple of days ago with our friends over at Redspin. Uh, we talked with Robert and Thomas um, who are you know, the compliance guys over at Redspin and their uh, customer, who's the CISO over at Aeroglen International, um, who underwent the voluntary assessment. So, you know, there were there was a lot of interesting stuff uh, that was said in that webinar, and I know uh, Noelle was uh, sidelined and couldn't couldn't make it, but she did see the recording. Yeah, I know. Do we see Do we see the sadness? I was see. so sad I missed it. I know. Love hanging out with Redspin. They are, they are some cool guys. Um, anyway, so we talked about a lot, a lot of important things. You know, first of all, it's important for everyone to learn kind of what it's like to go through a voluntary assessment because that's going to be really important as CMMC rolls out. But in my mind, as I listened to the recording a couple of times, there were three things that kind of stood out to me. And that's what uh, Noelle and I are going to talk about. So welcome to Compliance Corner. Those of you who have been waiting in fandom for Noelle, she's and better than ever. That I hope. Um, and let's, as they say in pink, get this party started. <laughs> I mean, how can I not be so excited when you have an entrance like that for me? Right. Thank you. Thank All right, you. So we're going to talk about three things today. Count them. One, two, three. Um, <laughs> one, I don't have enough. Three. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah whatever. All right, so we're going to talk about three things. One was the importance of preparation that uh, Errol Glenn highlighted. The two is the DFARS roadmap, and three is uh, FIPS, um, and just the importance of uh, what's the difference between FIPS and compliance and FIPS validated. Ooh, so, yeah. um, oh, Noelle, should, should we stop and give you a nap? Do you, do you oh, want my I have a cup of coffee <laughs> right here for you. It's been a very busy couple of weeks. <laughs> I apologize, everyone. So sorry. Mm, okay. Continue. You were saying that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the amount of time it took uh, Errol Glenn to, to prepare. And we're yep. going to talk about the DFARS roadmap. And lastly, we'll talk about FIPS, the difference between compliance and validation. So let's um, let's get to number one there. I love it. All right. So number one in the takeaways was uh, the emphasis that the big new placed on starting early. He talked about how they started, you know, two plus years ago, even before CMMC was a thing. Yep. Realizing that they wanted to up their cybersecurity game um, and really make cybersecurity a focus. And so what they started to do was think about how to, I guess the word is absorb cybersecurity into every part of their daily actions, right? Um, not just make it kind of a side thing, but make it, uh, make it focus. So um, they developed policies and procedures and technology that all kind of worked with one another and they took time to let the people absorb, uh, let their staff absorb them. So it wasn't uh, kind of something that was here today, but not followed tomorrow. And while that's been a comment that has rung through um, a lot of conversations we've had on Compliance Corner and uh, with with uh, webinars, I don't know that people have quite absorbed that important issue of you know, starting early and making cybersecurity, I think the term they used was something that has muscle memory. Yeah. So, um, what do you what do you say to all that? I just talked so, about it for a while. Yeah, that is that is a hundred percent. What like you said, we've said this on Compliance Corner. I don't even know how many times that one of the biggest, most important things that people miss out on. You know, you you look at compliance and say, okay, I've, I've got all these boxes. Here are the hundred and ten boxes. I'm going to check every one of the boxes, and once I check them, you know, I get my assessment, and then it's good, and I don't have to think about it for three years. That's right. 
that's not really how it's supposed to go, right? The reason we have compliance and the reason we have these checks is to not necessarily initialize, but incentivize, I guess maybe is a good word, an additional incentive incentivization of a company or organization to right. make cybersecurity something that is, like you said, like muscle memory. It's something that I've said many, many times to different customers and different potential customers that I've spoken to um, here at Prevail. The idea that every single auditor and assessor wants a story, you want to tell them a story. If they look at control 3.1.1, which is an access control, it's the very first control on, you know, on NIST 871. If you look at that control, okay, well, I need to, I need to do this and I need to write that down, that I'm going to do this. This is my policy that says that's going to be the policy. Okay, so here does 3.1.1 tell you to do? 3.1.1 is limit information system access to authorized users, users processing, acting on behalf of authorized users or devices, including other information systems. That's a very complicated way of saying that if I have an authorized user that is accessing my SharePoint, that I know that that authorized user is actually the person who is, you know, doing those commands. Like that right, not some, some Bob down the street. Right. And I know that the processes that that person is doing are associated with their account. So it's basically just, you want to make sure that you can validate that the person who's, you know, who's doing it is the person who's really doing it. And that the processes they're doing are all like on the, like, whatever system it is, are actually processes you can trace back to that user on their account. So you'd have a policy that stated that, yes, we're going to do that, a procedure that says this is how we make sure that happens. And then you'd have to be able to test it, like watch somebody walk through something and see, okay, well, this is the user, they did this, everything's fine. It's a story you're telling. And right. they also, you have to always remember that the auditor is going to have an interview with people who work at your company. If people at your company do not like internalize, habitualize and, and make that muscle memory of cybersecurity, they could very easily kind of, you know, mess everything up with what they say and be like, oh, well, I know there was a policy once that I read like that one time and I don't know what it said or whatever. And your auditors are going to see that the story is not complete because if you cannot habitualize that and make that it, a muscle memory for your employees, then you're missing a huge opportunity to A, make it cybersecurity a really integral part of your business, which everybody should do anyway. And B, you're going to probably mess yourself up with that assessment team. Right. So <laughs> muscle memory, it's not just for muscles anymore. It is also for your cybersecurity processes. Um, cybersecurity muscles. Cybersecurity muscles. There you go. Um, the point there is, you know, part of that. So part of the message there is A, start early. B, make sure your whole team is involved. Um, yep. And make sure those practices are, are known and repeatable. And, uh, you know, so that's for anyone who's out there and who hasn't quite started their their whole compliance process, this should be kind of a, a bit of a, I mean, there should have been a lot of the wake up calls, but this should uh, clearly be one of them. And another thing to add on to that, um, when you're talking about auditing and assessing, there's there's no, like with CMMC, specifically CMMC, and there's not really like a hard, fast rule of, oh, you have to have been doing these, you know, processes and procedures and policies have been implemented for, you know, three months or six months or whatever. But I'll tell you that sort of the guidance that I have always seen from different types of auditing and assessing I've been involved in is that it's a, it's a minimum of a few months, minimum. Because again, the idea is to make it muscle memory and that can't happen in six weeks. It can't happen in two weeks. It can't happen in two months. You, know, you need to have enough time and evidence as well. So it's not even just about making it muscle memory for everybody involved in your organization, although that's that's critical, but it's also about having the evidence to prove to your assessment team that it is muscle memory within. I mean, here's perhaps a somewhat tortured, but I think some still relevant um, a, a comparison. You know, when you're taking a class in school, it is usually a year long course, right? Particularly in high school, you're you're taking from September through June or May, through, right, to learn um, calculus or physics. And so you can think, you know, it, it probably takes about nine months for that muscle memory to be truly developed. Yep. Similarly, um, in CMMC, William. All right. I think, I think that's a good way of looking at it. All right. Let's uh, transition to our uh, next question. <laughs> We're having fun here. I love it. 
Next one, uh, and this is a little bit of a shorter conversation, Noel, but it is about DFARS as your roadmap. I think this was Robert who mentioned um, in the preparation and um, in terms of knowing what uh, they had to do in order to uh, prepare for compliance, DFARS was their roadmap. And, you know, that can be a little bit confusing because there's a lot of documentation that someone's having to look at when they're uh, looking to become NIST 800-171 and CMMC. Uh, level two compliant, right? There's DFARS, there's NIST uh, 800-171, and then there's uh, the compliance booklet, right? The customer responsibility matrix. The, Lots of paper. <laughs> so many things. Yes. So many things. There's, yeah, there's a lot of, there is, it's very, and we've talked about this before here, and I certainly have had this conversation many times with different customers and potential customers with Prevail. You know, you've got, it is conceivable at this point and again, hopefully this will not be the case, you know, further down the road. But at this point, it's conceivable you could get a CMMC assessment level two and be good to go, but not be DFAR 7012 compliant, which is kind of crazy when you think you could also not be, you know, DFAR 7019 compliant or DFAR 7021. Compliant. You know, there's there's a lot of different DFARs, specific big ones that we always deal with are 7012, uh, 7019 and 20, and then 7021, which is CMMC. So you could conceivably be good with the, you know, 7021, which is CMMC, which is not law yet, right, technically, and not be good with 7012, which is the law. Right. And so that's where a lot of that confusion comes from. So I totally understand what Rob was trying to say is that if you use sort of like DFAR 7012, especially as part of that roadmap, you can check off those boxes and, and make sure that not only are you going to be CMMC compliant, most likely, but you're also going to be DFAR 7012 compliant. Because if you're not DFAR 7012 compliant, just about every just about every contract in the DOD at this point has a 7012 clause. And as we talked about in our June memo conversation, they're starting to come down on that stuff more and more right. now. And if you're not doing that, you know, you already if you already have an active contract with the DOD and you have a 7012 clause and you're not following and adhering to those rules within 7012. That's going to be a huge problem if somebody comes up to you, you know, if your core or your KO or whoever says, hey, you know, it says here that you're, you know, you have a 7012 clause, so you should be good to go, right? You got those 110 controls going and you go, no, <laughs> it's not going to be the really best. We even have our Spurs score in and we haven't really quite created poems either. And yeah. My bad. Yeah. It's the the bottom of that point. Yeah. The DOD is not going to respond really kindly to that. So so if you're looking at the big DODs, or excuse me, big DFARS, which is 7012 is the big one, right? And the highlights on that are you have to have the NIST 800-171 controls. That is a huge thing to have to undertake, right? It's 110 controls and all the documentation that comes with it and everything else. And then you also have to make sure that you've got that C through G paragraphs covered, you know, making sure that you are adhering to all of the DOD incident response reporting functionalities, making sure that- you right? making sure everybody who works with you also is going to support the DOD and in any incident reporting, like image capturing and all kinds of different things. And then on top of that, you also have to make sure that like any CSP cloud service provider that you use is going to be at least FedRAMP moderate equivalent. And you can say, yes, I, I am comfortable with this organization. They are secure. I feel good about it. And be really able to back that up with a body of evidence and information, that kind of thing. And then on top of that, you've got like the spur stuff. So like 7019 and 7020 are talking about making sure you get assessments every three years. And then also spurs is talking, you know, 7019 is talking about you have to put in your information into the spurs system, SPRS. If, so if you don't do your SPRS score, which is basically, this is where we're starting from and be really honest about it. Hey, here are my 110 controls. I've only got maybe like 20 of them done. My score is like a negative hundred, but at least it's in there. And you have to have something honest. That's another thing too. So you want to make sure you follow that DFARS. And then obviously down the road, DFARS 7021, and there's been talk in the DOD, and I'm hoping they actually do this, that 7021 is going to become kind of all encompassing where like 7012 information will be in there, 7019 information will be in there. You can have one place to sort of go, yes, I need to follow all of these in 7021 and I'm good. But whether or not that happens or not, we don't know. So it may still end up being like multiple different DFARs that you have to kind of reference and stay on top of. So I get where he's coming from with that. I think that's probably a really good way of looking at it. All right. Let's, uh, and let's pick up one last question or one last uh, big thought out of, uh, out of our webinar. All right, let's, uh, let's transition to the next one. Okay. <laughs> I love it. 
I feel like we're on like the action news, you know, like yes. At five. Noel at five. And Orly comes into town. Huh. That sounds about right. Yeah. We shouldn't talk about tornadoes. There are seriously people who are suffering much more than yeah. That. Yeah. All right. Your brother okay? Yes, he's good. Yeah, he's good. They lost power for a while, but he's okay. He's fine. My best friend who's down there is good too. Everybody is okay. All right. Thank you. And our, our prayers and hopes are with the people in Florida. Yes. Hope you're all safe. If you're watching as, a, as a Floridian. So, you know, I mean, I'm in Virginia now, but still. Yeah. My heart, my heart will be in Florida probably my whole life. <laughs> all right. Um, this last question is uh, we're going to just focus really quickly on FIPS. All right, FIPS 140-2 compliance. So that is uh, the requirement for anyone who is kind of dealing with technology and um, the government, uh, probably uh, any other uh, controlled industry, but definitely with the government. And what does CMMC say about uh, FIPS compliance? So it there's multiple different controls that talk about FIPS, but the two big ones are making sure that you have encrypted at rest and encrypted in transit, and they have to be FIPS 140-2 encryption. So what that means is that that's it has to not just, and it can't just be, yes, I am a company that you are using, and I say that when you store your stuff in, in my cloud service, it is FIPS validated. Okay, great. Well, where's your certification number? All right, so let's just, just to be brutally explicit for everyone who's maybe listening to this. All right. You're a defense contractor. You uh, subcontract with a, um, a cloud service provider to either store your data or you have them um, some sort of software that does a firewall, some sort of uh, you're engaging with some sort of solution that touches your CUI. And so any of those technologies have to use FIPS 140-2 validated uh, encryption modules, yes. um, even at Prevail, right? We're a cloud service provider. We provide encrypted email and file sharing and we yep. have to be 140-2 um, validated. Now, what they were saying on, what Zbigniew was saying was he didn't realize how much of an issue that was going to be. It was like black and white. Oh, you're yeah. either uh, validated or you're not. Um, so why don't you, you know, go down that slope a little bit more? And, and I'm so glad you said this because the thing is, is that that word validated has been kind of thrown around by people who I think are sort of manipulating it. And some people in the industry who are like, oh, well, we're validated, meaning like I looked at it and I validated it. It's fine. That's not what that means. So I like to clarify to people. And I was so glad that you were like, oh, let's ask this question. I was like, oh, I've got this. This is great. So um, it's, it, yeah, it is a validation, but it's a validation from NIST. So meaning like, for example, like actually I can, I can pull up an example of what it should look like because that seems like, I'm going to see if I can get this to share. It's, oh, there you go. It's a share button on the bottom. As you see, this right here is an example. This is actually 100%. This is real. This is ours at Prevail. It is a NIST cryptographic module validation program, which is CMVP, which is run as you can see by the NIST organization. This is our cryptographic module validation, and this is the certification number. This is why I always bring up the word certification. If you cannot get a certification number from someone from, from this, the cryptographic module validation program, you see here it says active, and it says FIPS 140-2, and with us it says prevail. It does not have that information, and if you were talking to any organization, it doesn't matter who, who you're going to be storing your CUI or transmitting your CUI through, if they cannot give you something like this, like, oh, here's the link, no problem, they are not NIST validated. So that's why I always make sure to make that really, really clear to everyone because I've had multiple conversations with, with prospective customers and current customers who have said, oh, yeah, well, I've talked to people who said they were validated. Okay, cool. Did they give you a certification number? No. Were they supposed to? Yep. <laughs> and yes. They are. So if you don't have this, if you don't have a certification number, it is not FIPS 140-2. We've, we've definitely, I've had conversations with different people who are like, yeah, you know, I went through an audit with the DIBCAC and, you know, I had something that was close to FIPS. It was fine. You know, like they said it was okay. But when the DIBCAC came in, it wasn't because this certification was not available. So cannot drive this home more than I, I, I'm probably beating a dead horse, but Certification, certification, certification. The horse is crying, so stop. Poor little horse. 
It's so important though, because there are, unfortunately, and I hate to say this, but unfortunately there are a lot of people out there who are trying to take advantage of individuals and right. they're trying to say, oh yeah, yeah, sure. We've got all those things. And like, and sometimes they don't even know. It's not even like intentionally malicious. They just honestly are ignorant to it and they don't know. So I want to make sure everybody knows if there is FIPS 140-2 and they say they're validated. Make sure that you get that NIST um, certification number and you, you should be able to just look it up immediately. All right. Um, so hopefully we have, uh, hammered home that, that point that FIPS encryption is, uh, kind of worth the paper it's written on. You want FIPS certification. And, uh, that is, that is the third point we want to bring, um, bring up today. All right. I think we're at the end of another corner. Believe it or not, we've actually said everything we needed to. Crazy. Wow. All right. Crazy. So, um, time flies when you're having fun, really. Time flies when you're having fun. We should thank the audience. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, thank you for listening to this. Um, if you like this show, give us a thumbs up. Uh, you can subscribe. And as always, uh, we look forward to bringing you another episode of Compliance Corner sometime in the very, very new future, like maybe next week. Hopefully. Right. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.